Greetings, fellow constant readers. You are listening to, or maybe you're watching, The Company of the Mad, The Stand Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Seacrest. On today's episode, my distinguished panel and I will be discussing chapters 25 through 42 of Stephen King's epic novel, The Stand. But we don't want to be the only ones talking about it. We want to hear from you. So if you're reading or rereading the novel right along with us, be sure to let us know. Drop us a line using the hashtag TheStandChallenge on Twitter. We would love to hear your thoughts. If you're listening to The Stand Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or other such audio-only platforms, hey man, that's pretty cool. But don't forget that you can also watch the video exclusively at TheStandPodcast.com. Then you can see all our smiling faces. The sandpodcast.com, by the way, is also where you will get links to all of our Twitters, bonus podcast episodes, and a whole lot more. Mike Flanagan is with us. He is the writer and director of Dr. Sleep, Netflix's The Haunting of Hill House, and so much more. He's currently finishing up production on The Haunting of Bly Manor. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Tanana Reeve Dew is a novelist and the producer of Shudder's Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. She teaches Black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA, and you can take her online digital download course, The Sunken Place, by going to TananaReeveDo.com. Tanana Reeve, hello. Hi, everyone. Anthony Bresnikan is a novelist and has worked as a reporter for the Arizona Republic, the Associated Press, USA Today, and Entertainment Weekly, just to name a few. He is currently the Los Angeles correspondent for Vanity Fair. Hello, Anthony. Hey, Hey, I got to give Tanana Reeve a shout out, though, before we get too far. The, your Twilight Zone episode is out this week, right? It's coming out next. Uh, yes, it's coming out. Yes, it's out. Yeah, when this comes out, it's out. Yes. We're in the future, Tanana Reeve. We're in the We're future. The future. <laughs> so, yes. That's perfect. And it's had an amazing response. Everyone loves it. <laughs> <laughs> what, which episode number is it? It's number eight, and it's called A Small Town. And thank you so much for mentioning that, because since it's episode eight, I thought I would have to wait eight weeks from the premiere date to see it. And the CBS was like, no, it's coming out in a a binge. So thank you. I'm so excited. They dropped the entire season at once, didn't they? Yes. Oh, that's amazing. You 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 co-wrote it with your husband, Stephen, right? I did. I'm I'm so starry-eyed over the episode. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for saving my marriage, Anthony. I'm, I'm <laughs> Definitely yes, co-wrote. We also husband and wife writing a pair. Uh, so yes, I co-wrote that episode with my husband, Stephen Barnes, who who also wrote episodes for the 80s version of The Twilight Zone. So he's an oh, old cool. awesome. No way. Oh, yes. That's awesome. Wow. Yes. That, was, that show is, the, the 80s uh, Twilight Zone was great. They were really good episodes. Yes. Those scared the heck out of me when I was a kid. Yeah, so it's a homecoming for him and my first scripted television episode for me Very congratulations cool. congratulations, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. yeah that's insane. well done incredible i cannot wait to watch we're also joined today by a very special guest you may recognize her from such films as oculus hush and gerald's game or you might know her as theo crane on the haunting of hill house kate siegel is here with us and she is a longtime constant reader welcome oh, kate yeah to the company of the mad. Wow, okay. thank you guys. It's such an honor to be here. Thanks for allowing me to step into the asylum for the day. <laughs> Absolutely. Now listen, on our first episode, I asked everybody the same question and I'd like to pose it to you. How is it that you came to love Stephen King and mm-hmm. when did you first read The Stand? Wow. Um, I have been a fan of Stephen King for so long that I'm not exactly sure the first time I read one of his books. I know that in the basement of my house, my dad had these floor to ceiling bookshelves with every single Stephen King book on them. And my dad was an investment lawyer. Like he was a very serious guy, but this was like his collection of Stephen King books. And as a matter of fact, I'm sitting here with his copy of The Stand that has traveled with me across the country into every other place I have uh, ever lived. And so I know that I was reading it really early, like in, like probably inappropriately early, probably 
like somewhere between eight and 10, I started with the short stories. And I have read The Stand at least once a year since then. I think I, I, I you know, this sounds ridiculous and that's why I'm so thrilled to be here. I truly believe that in very short amount of time, this will become one of the great American novels. I think it, it oh, really addresses, yeah, it addresses huge important issues that are deeply American, anything like in the same way that Steinbeck does or, you know, any of our great American novelists, they, yeah, this is a really important book. And I think it's extremely important right now. And I think Stephen King is as close as I get to like hero worship in the way that he addresses female characters and the way that he addresses relationships between people and the way that he is able to scare me into insomnia. And the way that he can be almost like a prophet. I mean, the fact that this is written in the 1970s and what we're looking at today is just, you know, over a month ago, we entered into this project of rereading The Stand and Mike noted on the first episode how strange it is to be reading a novel in which the escapist hook is a global pandemic and then you close the book and you look out the window at the global pandemic. Yeah. And as we enter into the next 200 pages of The Stand, it's, what it really, I mean, what it really is is heartbreaking. It's, it's heartbreaking and startling and just completely surreal to see the times that we're living in mirrored once more. Chapter eight or chapter 26 begins with uh, law enforcement officials using violence to stop people from taking or airing videos in which they are speaking the truth. The National Guard is brought in to prevent looting. There's uh, a man on the street who's carrying a sign that's speaking his particular and personal truth, and he is descended upon, attacked, and beaten with it. In the book and in the world today, we have gone from pandemic to pandemonium. And there is such a heaviness that I felt reading this chapter and that I feel even speaking about it now. I'd like to get each of your thoughts on what it is that you felt as you started your read or your reread through these particular pages of The Stand. Tanana Reeve? Yeah, I'll just jump in and it is uh, sad, as you say, Jason. Um, it really is. an uplifting element to worldwide protests uh, for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter and the growing awareness and the willingness of so many people to listen who, who really weren't paying attention to hashtags before the killing of George Floyd, before the killing of Breonna Taylor. I do, I do feel hopefulness in that sense. So I want to start from a hopeful place. But it's more than eerie. Um, how thin the veneer is over what so many of us have viewed as American society when someone goes outside to speak the truth or hold up a protest sign, et cetera, et cetera. There are lines from chapter 26 that really uh, jump out at me. Uh, it's still a free country, right? <laughs> uh, one, one journalist says, or these men are acting like Nazis, not American soldiers. Those are kids, they're just kids, they're not armed. So there's what you see on the news, which is one version, you know, if there's a fire or if there's violence, uh, you see that on the news, but on social media, there's a different version that often doesn't get addressed on the news, like protesters who lost eyes, just a rant, a journalists who were attacked. It's not, it's not getting addressed on the news. It's insane. It, I, I, when I talk to my mother who doesn't have things like, you know, she, she has Facebook, but she doesn't have Twitter and, and Instagram and that sort of thing. I'm like, you wouldn't believe the, the, the videos that I've seen that I sent her and she's like, why isn't, why isn't this on the news? Why is it's, it's bizarre. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's, it's so, and, and that way it's a, it's a teachable moment. I think for all of us who live in the country, some who were more aware than others, it happened during Ferguson that journalists were attacked by police. That's how Ferguson made national news when journalists were attacked. And that lesson hasn't been learned apparently. Um, there are some very, very serious issues that have to be addressed in, in law enforcement. I, I was grateful though, one way that reality departed in, in a good way was the military pushing back mm -hmm. against being used to suppress protesters, which is hugely, hugely important. So again, that speaks to that hopefulness, just when you feel like you're teetering at the edge of, oh my gosh, even I, 
I, with all my cynicism and all my black history lessons, don't recognize what's going on right now. There's, there's that hope that we can not just write, you know, go back to where we were, but to be better than we were. You did mention, I, I noticed on, on your Twitter account, I loved that there was this moment where you were discussing with someone else everything that's going on in the protesting. And you said, you said, is it, is it wrong for me to say this? Or is it weird for me to say that uh, this is one of the few times or one of the first times I think you said that you felt oddly hopeful that there was that there was a a feeling of of positivity surrounding I, I, I know what you mean um in the run-up to the last election a lot of people were like what is happening that was like the catchphrase what is happening what is it and after a while it got so repetitive that i retired it because things were just getting worse and worse and worse and worse for so many populations in the united states but then i found myself in the wake of protests and widening awareness thinking what is happening what is happening? And it was like a cheerful what is happening. And that's something I wasn't used to. And, you know, it'll ebb and flow. But right now, I do feel that we are in a good place to, to do a better job than, than the characters in the stand. <laughs> hey, as our, a as a, job. <laughs> what was that, Anthony? We couldn't do a worse job. <laughs> they pretty hey. much blow it. it was me yeah. that, before the society collapses, and then, you know, arguably. Well, yeah, uh, do all right. Kate, what was, what was your feeling as you were coming to these particular pages? Going through those pages, I think the thought that was going through my head over and over again was just there, but for the grace of God, go us. I think that it was interesting. It's, it's written at a time before cell phones and before social media. And there's a certain sense that we are, hit with a constant tidal wave of this 24 hour news cycle and that it can be really detrimental to people's spirit in situations like these. But I think it also keeps us from a lot of this panic because the pandemic requires us to stay home. And part of the reason we can stay home is that we can connect with each other through technology, right? And if we didn't have that, and part of what makes a protest so powerful right now is that people are risking their own health because the general health of society is at more danger than the individual's respiratory system. We have to go out there and stand up to the things we believe in now, and that's more important than the coronavirus for people. But in these pages, because these people can't get information from Twitter and they can't get information from the internet, the distribution requires them to go out into the world and that kind of hits these more powerful protest moments where the the army is shooting on kids, where people are taking over news stations. And I think we are saved in some way from that by social media. But it is, this escapist book is not escapist at all. It, it could very easily, we could just make a, a little left and we could be in this situation. If Trump did what he said and he uh, silenced the media, some stations would fight back and you would have situations like this. You're absolutely right. Anthony, how, how did you feel as you were coming to it? Well, I thought this was one of the scariest chapters of the book. I think the tunnel sequence is, you know, famously a, a creepy, eerie uh, sequence in the stand. But the breakdown of society, when you see people dying, not just from the gooey Captain Tripp's illness, but turning on each other, violently so, the Ray Flowers sequence always got to me. And I actually thought it was really well done in the original miniseries too. Um, Kathy Bates, they gender swapped it and Kathy Bates played Ray Flowers. And, and um, the idea that, um, uh, that you would be gunned down on the air, you know, that yeah. that is somehow not as bad as the news getting out to the people who are holding those guns. Uh, is a pretty terrifying prospect. It reminds me a little of, uh, I think it was uh, Allende in um, in Chile who was giving a radio broadcast when Pinochet's uh, uh, when when Pinochet's forces were taking over the country and he was killed. I, I don't know if it was uh, like on the air, but right after he made like a kind of defiant broadcast, and um, mm -hmm. you know uh, that. That kind of thing is is really chilling and disturbing. Uh, the sh the way you know some of the soldiers are like, are we really going to do this? Like that also freaked me out. I think I kind of wonder if that's what happens in a mob mentality when you have 
police officers in riot gear kind of psyching each other up and scared themselves maybe a little and, and ready to, mm -hmm. and feeling threatened and psychologically threatened and criticized and ready to lash out. That anger could be explosive, all it takes. I've covered protests as a journalist um, for, for years, years before I did entertainment. I was a general assignment reporter and I would cover things like that. And sometimes they would go badly and it always, you could always see where it went bad, where somebody threw a punch or threw a bottle or a cop hit somebody with a club and that's where the conflagration spread. And um, it's funny, I wanna bring up something. Uh, our host Jason tweeted about this. The next 200 pages in the stand begin with law enforcement using violence to stop people from taking airing videos that speak the truth. The National Guard is brought in to prevent looting. A man on the street carrying a sign is attacked and beaten with it. And he got a reply. I don't know if I can, uh, you get I guess you can't really see that. The reply <laughs> itself is from Stephen King. It doesn't change, does it? That was pretty remarkable that he saw that. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. I have a feeling that it's thanks to Mike that he saw it. I think Mike retweeted, the, I think Mike retweeted it right before Stephen oh, King really? did so. It's it's probably thanks to our our distinguished panelists, one of our distinguished panelists, Mike Flanagan. So we oh, gotta get Uncle Steve on this <laughs> podcast. That would be incredible, man. That'd be great. <laughs> All of that said, there was one part of this sequence that really bothered me, and uh, it was the uh, black men in loincloths who take over, uh, I guess, a game show set or something. And yeah. To me, that was like uh, every now and then. I love seeing. <laughs> And I love his work. It means a lot to me. But every now and then, there's just a part of the book that I wish wasn't there. And this was, I have to say, this was one. I don't know what he was going for. I guess maybe some sort of a re regressive thing that society's breaking down and they're going, uh, you know, violent or tribal or something. I, I, I don't really get what was going on there, but I didn't really care for it. And yeah, it's, it's a pink leather uh, loincloth, I think. Yeah, where did you get the Second reading, I was like, oh, it's pink leather. I, I think there is something he's going for with it that is not like Tarzan loincloth kind of ask. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not sure. And um, yeah, I have to say um, those kind of references do pop out at me and kind of throw me out of the story for a second. And then I, I come back in. But, and, and I too have so much great admiration for Steve, as we'll call him, for the show. Um, and I know as an artist myself, in fairness, that I have been to readings where I'm reading my own story that I wrote 20 years ago, and I come across a phrase that jumps out like, not maybe loincloth, but not my best moment. You know, I wasn't thinking about a fuller readership. Uh, I had, my thinking hadn't evolved, and, and even if it's in the character's head, I just feel weird, so I'll just skip right over that. You know, <laughs> I would just like not read that, that word or that phrase, like keep it moving. And I, and I have a feeling uh, if he were doing that, he might, he might, he might do something similar with, with a reference like the one claw. Speaking of your, your writing and, and your reading, guess what I read uh, at around noon today? I read a short story by Tanana Reevedu called oh. Herd Immunity. Oh, right. And Herd Immunity is, it's a, uh, my goodness, what a, what a fantastic short story. I mean, you have, you've really, in talking about, you know, the fact that Stephen King is almost prophetic in what he's doing and acting like a prophet, I mean, you've literally done the same thing here. I mean, it's, you, you, have, you have pinpointed certain aspects of this pandemic, and like, the, um, in a, like the people who are continuing to wear the masks, the wanting to um, stay a certain distance away from people, and the other people who are insistent that there's no need for that anymore. There's all kinds of the fact that, that, that this sort of germ originates in China. All, all, all of this is, it's very interesting. Like you, you're really quite the prophet yourself. It's, and well, I, I mean, well, homage to Stephen King, first of all, in writing about plague, any, any plague story that comes to my mind is always gonna go back to, you know, having read the stand in childhood, but, but also that was, for, um, that was for an anthology called The End Is Now where it was supposed to be what would the end of the world feel like so even though she's not the last survivor she meets this guy on the road she thinks they're both immune uh, i won't give away the ending but let's just say we shouldn't always make assumptions <laughs> oh um, man 
The part about the masks is eerie. So at the very, very beginning, or when the pandemic was on its way, I started tweeting that story back when we were all watching Contagion, and we were like, oh, you know, let's try to manage our fear by diving in. But then at a certain point, I couldn't watch any more plague movies or read any more plague stories. So I stopped tweeting that story. But now that there's this movement toward reopening, and I see so many people walking out around without these masks, I've Cautionary started tale. tweeting it again. It's like, hello. This isn't over just because you want it to be over. Yeah, total cautionary tale now. It's really something. It's, 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 a, be- it's a beautiful and brilliantly written piece of work, though. Like, I mean, it's, it's, I was, it was an absolute joy to be able to, to read it today. And anyone who was looking for it, um, you can actually find it online. Um, if you just do a Google search for it, you can find it, I believe, and, and read it. It's, um, it's really, really something. It's uh, free. Yeah, it's free. <laughs> Mike, um, how did you feel when you were reading uh, chapter 26 in particular? Well, I think very similar to, to what everybody else has said, for sure. And I agree, it's, it's, its relevance to our current situation is uncanny and disturbing and weirdly, darkly cathartic. Um, I felt also reading it, uh, I completely agree with you, Anthony, this is some of the scariest stuff in the whole book um and you know the tunnel sequence of course and even you know Stu's escape um terrifying it and for me um there was a, a section of this that i i either had completely forgotten about or just didn't land on me the first time i read the book before i had kids but the entire second wave oh. section about you know oh, the, that's the, the other eliminate oh, the worst the the story of the little little Sam Tauber, the the five year old, whose family dies and is left alone, and it's it's only a page, really, the the whole thing, mm-hmm. uh, and that was like a just a just a dagger to the heart for me. Uh, I just couldn't. It was one of the most horrifying and matter of fact and detached, but so realistic and likely uh, stretches totally. of the book. And and it just um, that whole section, which had another had another moment, I think, similar to the to the game show bit, where I was like, I, uh, I, I don't know about the the woman who um, the whole thing was about how she feared rape, mm. and that was like, kind what of what a the, loser she is. For yeah, it, so it, it, was a, it was a very strange section, and and um, but ultimately, for as as horrifying as it was, and how I still felt like there's that uncanny moment you have where you, you close the this section of the book and you look outside and you still feel like it's 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 a parallel story and, and it's way too close for comfort. The fascinating thing about this stretch for me um is in the introduction of who I think is is might so far be my favorite character of the book on this read, which is Glenn. Um mm. and I loved Glenn and, and I was trying to figure out why. And so the, the two things I wanted to do is I want to read a, a very brief section of something he says that really bowled me over because it, I think there's a major tonal shift in the story the, the second he appears. And I was trying to figure out what that was about, like what, what, why the air changed when Glenn Bateman showed up. And so this paragraph just kind of knocked me down and then I'll tell you why, why I think that is. Um, but he, he's sitting there and he's, you know, he's fishing and he's, He's, uh, he says to Stu, you know, I, I was prejudiced against the world. I admit that freely. The world in the last quarter of the 20th century had, for me at least, all the charm of an 80-year-old man dying of cancer of the colon. They say it's a malaise which has struck all Western peoples as the century, any century, draws to a close. We have always wrapped ourselves in mourning shrouds and gone around crying, woe to thee, O Jerusalem, or Cleveland, as the case may be. The dancing sickness took place during the latter part of the 15th century. Bubonic plague, the Black Death, decimated Europe near the end of the 14th. Whooping cough near the end of the 17th and the first known outbreaks of influenza near the end of the 19th. We've become so used to the idea of the flu. It seems almost like the common cold to us, doesn't it? That no one but the historian seems to know that a hundred years ago it didn't exist. Um, and that to me, I, I, I thought was, I mean, other than, than being, again, profoundly relevant to, to where we are right now, um, what struck me about the difference between this character and, and the others is that Glenn is talking with authority and, and with knowledge about the past, 
the present, and for the first time in the novel, the future. Um, and I, I thought that was incredibly striking that, you know, we have all these characters who are caught in this immediate sense of the present, um, who are kind of uniformly terrified of the present throughout it. And, and then talk about the past, you know, Larry talks about his mother and, and Franny remembers, you know, growing up and everybody kind of looks backward and looks at where they are and they're paralyzed. And then all of a sudden this character comes in who's looking ahead and his whole thing to Stu is about what is society going to be like after this? Our baby's going to be immune. What will civilization do to pick itself up? What will that look like? Um, no other character in the book to this point has had forward facing vision. And Glenn is looking at it academically, um, but with this very wry and gentle um, wit to him um, that I think comes with the fact that he's not gonna live much longer anyway. You know, um, that Glenn had already kind of come to the point in his life where he feels like he's lived a full one and is now witness to this. And it, it, it's such a different voice and it's such a different air um, that all of a sudden that suffocating feeling that I'd had um, reading, and a wonderful suffocating feeling, you know, reading up to this point, the, the horrors of, of Captain Trips and the horrors of the breakdown of civilization and the horrors of these people dying anonymous deaths alone. All of that, I got to kind of exhale for a second and say, yeah, okay, so what now? What are the steps forward from this point? Um, and I was momentarily jealous of the book for that. Um, it, it, it was a, a very strange sensation of, of just kind of being like, ah, oh, God, to, to feel, what will it feel like when we feel like this particular wave that we're caught in has crested and receded, you know? And, and I'm sure that's not going to be easy for any of us, but just that sense of, of what that could feel like, um, just, I think kicked in a new, a new instrument in this story. And, um, yeah, that was really that was what I came away with the most on, on this he's, he's such a wonderful character. He, um, it almost feels, you're right, it's so, such a different character from anyone who we've encountered so far. And it almost feels like another part of Stephen King's mind. Like, it, it, it's so genuine and it's so genuinely written and it's sort of like the academic part of his mind. And it, it, it does sort of make me wonder suddenly if, all of these characters are just different personalities who live inside of him. Um, I do think that there is, um, there's a very interesting parallel in the forward looking characters in the way that Glenn looks forward, but you forget that also Franny is someone who is obsessed about the future because she's pregnant. And so we do have this in this section, one of my favorite parts of this book is Franny burying her father and pregnant Franny having to look down at the corpse of her dad and make the emotional choice to wash him. And at first, remember, she doesn't make that choice. She's like, I can't do it. I can't possibly. And then as she thinks about the future and she is locked, uh, she's lost in her own thought downstairs and she almost sets the house on fire cooking potatoes, she realizes that the person she wants to be is the person who washes and dresses her father and buries him in the garden. Um, and she starts to come to terms with herself and her mother and her dad in that moment, something that Larry never does, something that Harold never does. Uh, Stephen, Steve, as we call him in this podcast, he gives his, uh, his women this opportunity to grow and change. I love his women in this book. And we forget that this was written at a time where people would expect that kind of self-awareness from your male lead, from your Larry Underwood. And he doesn't get there until way later. But Franny and Dana and Sue and Nadine, they're already looking forward. There's this political theory that the only people who should be able to be president are women with young children because they're the only people who are actually living in the future. And I think that Franny is a great example of that. It's a great balance to Glenn because like you said, Glenn has a sociological kind of distance from this because he's not going to live 50 years either way. Whereas Franny is desperate to know about the future and to build the future. And the second in this section, she and Harold stumble on Stu. She's like, yes, we need more people. We need to gather together. And she is kind of the opposite balancing force to that future movement. 
Anthony, were you were you wanting to to break in there and say something? I was going to say something. I was trying to look it up, not to like name drop or anything, but um, when I interviewed King uh, about a month ago, there, our first look at the new Stan miniseries, he um, he explicitly said, "Glenn Bateman is the character he created to add his own voice to the story." Like he's like, he was like, "Glenn is me stepping in to talk about my views on." what we mean as a society, what we are going forward. And it's funny because when Mike was reading that section, I was like, this sounds like it could almost be from like an introduction to the book, right? Like where he's talking yeah. about the flu and how we perceive the flu or how we're afraid of things or, or cease to be afraid of them. And um, yeah, he, he flat out said, my ideas about what makes a society are all expressed through Glenn. So the fact that he has a different tone to him, he's almost like the narrator stepping in but becoming part of the cast like part of the story and so you guys were right on whatever you picked up i didn't know that until he told me but there it is he is he he puts on the the hat and the, the picks up the paintbrush and he's glenn <laughs> well there there is this i mean mike do you want to read it there's this fantastic other quote from glenn you read the last one so well there's this great quote from glenn on what creates a society. Oh, um, can I do it? Um, you can absolutely, yes. I, I mean, thought Mike was going to read my quote. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's sort of like, it expresses what the entire book is about in many ways. So please, absolutely read it. Well, of course, now it won't be the same one you're thinking of at all. But, uh, oh, but it might not be, but I think right. it is. I think Show so. me a man or woman alone. Yes, you I'll got it. I'll show you a saint. Give me two, they'll fall in love. Give me three, they'll invent the charming thing we call society. Give me four and they'll build a pyramid. Give me five and they'll make one an outcast. Give me six and they'll reinvent prejudice. Give me seven and in seven years they'll reinvent warfare. Man may be made in the image of God, but human society is made in his opposite number. And that is definitely the passage that made me think, that's king. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you confirmed that. Yeah, Because I, I thought that that might be the case. Um, but I do find it an interesting contrast um, between Glenn and Franny. Um, because Glenn is that older character, more of a philosopher. He, he reminds me a lot of my dad, who's, who's 85, civil rights lawyer. And when various things happen in the news that have me completely upset, he still has his sense of humor, typically. And he's focused on the philosophical questions, right? He lives in his head in that way. And mm -hmm. I'm more like, I'm a mom. I've got a 16-year-old son. What in the world, you know, am I going to have to be terrified that he's going to be pulled over or whatever? So there is an interesting difference in approaching uh, these kinds of traumas and questions according to whether you're uh, in my dad's place where he's lived a very long life and he's seen a lot of change and ups and downs and things get bad and things get better. And Franny, who's, who I can't even imagine, frankly, I can't imagine, honestly, I feel so badly for anyone who's pregnant now mm -hmm. in actual life. Who, who's and it's getting a little bit better. I understand maternity wards have some different vibes where you don't feel like necessarily you're taking your life in your hands. But yeah, to bring a new life into this world at a time when there is so much uncertainty and growing uncertainty would be really, really daunting. So that does make Franny a really interesting character. But Glenn, yeah, when he speaks, it's like he wanted to stop everything. Well, Glenn, Glenn almost, Glenn almost speaks for Franny in one section. Where I mean, I think that the, maybe I'm I don't just, think Franny would allow that. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, you're probably right. But like, I mean, I, 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 I think it's just maybe I, I'm a complete idiot. I, I very pos possibly am. But like, I remember the first time that I read the novel, feeling like uh, when we get to Glenn talking about. Uh, whether or not babies will be uh, immune to this or whether they won't be, it's like for the first time it dawns on me, wait a minute, Franny's got a baby. Like what's, what's going to happen with her baby? Like I remember just yeah. being like, I hadn't even thought because Franny hasn't talked about it. Franny hasn't actually like uttered any words about that yet, about questioning what will happen to her child. She Is just, she writing in her journal yet at this point? Not no. yet, not yet, no. She hasn't started the book. No, but I I mean, think that's interesting, and I don't mean to interrupt. I told no, you I'm a terrible no. interrupter, and if yeah. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. all right. No, but I think that has something to do with when she falls in love. I think that Franny is in a, I, 
what I hope to bring to like this understanding, I don't have a deep understanding of King or story structure or writing novels like that. But what I do have is um, a love of character. And what I do see in Franny is that she didn't love Jess, the father of this child. The man she loved, her father, she had to bury. There was a lot of trauma in pushing that down. She, she doesn't really deal with the baby when she's carrying her very heavy father down the stairs. She's not worried. We don't have a lot of her worry about losing the child at that moment. And then when she and Stu meet, and then he says later in the book, it takes them about four hours to fall in love. After that moment, she starts to worry about the child verbally. She starts writing it down in the book, in the diary, which, you know, becomes downfall later, but that's okay. Um, but I think that the falling in love the, is something that ch changes her. And Franny, the combination of Franny and Glenn sits with me in the same way that like, I desperately want to have dinner with Tabitha King because there's got to be someone in King's life that is like this, this woman who becomes passionate and um, she's feminist at a time before you were allowed to be a feminist character. And she starts to write down and keep record in the same way Glenn does. I think and I made that, that leap just in the middle of my thought process, but she is such the emotional kind of heartbeat of this group even later on when they become the ad hoc committee she ends up taking care of everybody and kind of speaking as the conscience as glenn goes on to be the the mind the heart and the mind well wow. yeah i mean you couldn't have said it better i mean she's we were talking i talked a lot about franny in in the last episode in saying i do feel personally more connected to her chapters, I don't know why, than anyone else's. Like they, they suck me in for some reason where it's that weird thing that only happens really, I think when you're reading a book where you just get completely lost in the story. You're not thinking about time or space or anything. And I think we all have characters that we do that with. But for me, it's, and that's the great thing about this thing is there's so many characters you can, you, yeah. can, you can choose any of them. For me personally, it's, it's every time, I, I just keep waiting for another Franny chapter. I'm just like, as I'm turning, I'm like, like I like I love them all. I'm not going to say yeah. anything about any of them, but there are certain chapters that I'm like, all right, Lloyd, get through it. Like, <laughs> like, like I want to get. Well, I think King I loves Franny. It. He loves her. It feels yeah. like he loves her. Yeah, absolutely. Which to me, like Mike, you're a writer. When you write for me, I can feel that you love me. I feel that like you love me. I feel it when I read it. Because, you know. He puts you in terrible situations. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, but he writes with such it's love. Terrible. Like, think about Theo Crane. Think about, like, the depth of understanding of humanity Mike gave her. Because Mike, at that time, was writing for someone he truly loved. And I feel that when I read Franny. I Wait feel King loving her. Wait a minute. Do you two know each other? Oh, God, that's so <laughs> awkward. Sorry, no. I'm, a, like, a stalker of Mike's. So... <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kate and Mike are married, in case you did not know. Oh, right. um, in case you're just tuning in for the first time to that information. So um, sorry. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. Everybody <laughs> no, I love it. And it's great. It's it's probably true. Mike, is is that true? But, but they're quarantining from each other, as you see. <laughs> they are. They're in completely separate houses. To... <laughs> they're not. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Mike, do, do, do you feel that way about, about character and about writing when you're really passionate about a character? Do you find that it, it comes across more on, on the page? Oh, certainly. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think King is such an empathetic writer in general um, with his character. I think he's in love with a lot, of, a lot of the characters on this page. I even feel love for Lloyd, you know, in, in that beautiful scene where, where Flag finally comes into the, into the prison. Oh, yes. True. You know? Um, and, uh, yeah, but I, I think the, the point is absolutely correct. I think, you know, um, I, I do think he writes a lot about Tabitha as well. I, I, I think, think so she, she appears in a number of different incarnations throughout his, his library of work. And, and I wouldn't at all be surprised if he were to say, yes, if you, if you look at Franny, that's, that's where I saw the most of Tabitha. Uh, that, that wouldn't shock me. Um, I don't know that, but that would be a, a good guess based on, on the way he does that. I, I think another um, another character that I, I think we should spend some time on too um, is he introduces another major uh, incredible woman um, to the story um, in that we finally really get a look at Mother Abigail. 
in this section. We get just um, a first glimpse at her. Yeah. A little, what a, what yeah. a glimpse it is, man. Like, so great. And, and just really, that's, an, that's another character that for sure completely sucks me in anytime uh. that I'm reading the book. I mean, and it's just, it's a, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful sort of introduction to everything that is, that is to come with her. Does anyone um, see anyone other than Ruby D when they read Mother Abigail? Like, I just pure Ruby D. Yeah, it's hard not to. Uh, it's hard not to at this point. I, I, I know I'm, she's Whoopi Goldberg in the new miniseries, know, right? And I'm sure Whoopi will do great, but until I see yeah. that, it's definitely Ruby D in my, in my memory. You know, Whoopi said she wanted the part back in the day, 20 years ago when they first. Wow. Started. I'm like, excited to see her, see her Mother Abigail. Well, so she heard the couldn't you know make it happen or was approached by it and not but she always loved the character and uh, you know we'll see what she does hey it's, it's always nice to see it oh, of course interpretation. I, ruby d was great ruby d and aussie davis was also in the stand you right. know? i don't think they had any scenes together come to think of it but uh um but uh that's a nice showcase for the two of them <laughs> yeah it's, it's, I think, going to be very interesting. It, it strikes me how much I picture the cast of McGarris's adaptation yeah. when I read this. Me too. Um, and how I, I had to make that little adjustment with Rita, where I was like, oh, right. It, it, was, it was always just Nadine in the miniseries. But of course, no, this is a different character. Um, and, and I went through the that, same thing. I went through the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's that thing of like, ah, oh, and here's, you know, I, I, see, uh, I, I see Laura San, San Giacomo. And, and it was like, oh, no, 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 not yet. Not yet. She's not here yet. Um, but uh, it's funny. I, I think of Glenn, and it's like I, all I see is Ray. Uh, Ray. Oh God, I'm blanking. Uh, Ray, Walston. my favorite Martian. Ray, yes. Uh, Ray Walston, yes. Um, and I believe it's Greg Kinnear playing right. him in the in the new one. And I love Greg Kinnear. Uh, and so I'm 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 fascinated to see how how he'll be able to kind of push push Ray out of my mind. Um, Although I love the casting of Rita. We were talking about that. That's Heather Graham, right? Yeah, that it's, um, there's this weird thing that happens when you read The Stand and you read it as a teenager and these people all seem so old. And then you read it again in your 20s and you're like, oh, right, totally. And now in my late 30s, reading it again and being like, oh, I'm way too old for all of this. Like these are all (laughs) people in their young 20s. Everyone's younger than you. Everyone's younger. And then you get to Rita and then she's like, the first time you read it, this kind of decrepit old woman approaching 50 and I'm just like, whoa <laughs> then I'm on IMDb and I'm like oh no that's literally Heather Graham's we, actual age yeah. and I oh, oh really too much <laughs> Heather Graham <sighs> it's, it's on the internet so I don't know if it's true Heather or not Graham is almost I mean I'm almost I'm getting there too so it's, she, according to IMDb she turns 50 this year wow so she's Heather the perfect Graham? I know that's like the uh, the stand the great American novel <laughs> hey, Bill, Bill and Ted are now middle aged. So, you know, mm-hmm. We're so old. Yeah. Since you all brought Rita up, I just thought I have to say, um, you know, and she's fine. I feel bad for her. Um, obviously, she was traumatized and all that. But I, I don't know. I keep thinking about that movie, The Mountain Between Us, where you're in the disaster, but you're with Idris Elba. <laughs> and Rita. <laughs> didn't put on comfortable shoes. <laughs> She's just the, walking the white fail. privilege. To That's what she is. We a dead city on foot. She knew. I'm thinking, well, did he not tell her they were on foot? I mean, what? I don't know. It's the trauma. It's the trauma. But since, I, as I said in the last podcast, I am very partial to Larry, as flawed a character as he is, or perhaps because he's so flawed, I really found myself empathizing with his situation. I mean, of course, it's horrible that Rita died. It's horrible. And the way she died is also very horrible. But his sense of relief, I could forgive him for, is all I'm saying. He didn't even want to entertain it. He feels bad. Now he's no nice guy, all that. But I, I think on one level, he was also being hard on himself um, because it's, it would be tough to survive long term. You have a thing like for Rita Larry. Rita. <laughs> You've got a thing for I do. Larry. I like, <laughs> and you know, the Larry. casting. The casting for Larry in the new miniseries is really good. It's uh, Jovan Adepo who was mm-hmm. in. He was in that J.J. Abrams produced um, World War II movie about the Nazis. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that was Overlord. Good. It's an honor. I I thought of Larry when I read your story today, and the with the with the guitar slung 
on on the dude's back because he was you know maybe that was unconscious homage as well because again you know it went deep that whole idea man you're just breaking in and this happens Uh, (laughs) i know it's petty it's petty but that's kind of where i was and um i i was i was in love with larry even before i knew they were casting him black there anthony Mm -hmm. so uh i don't know there's something about that character but that dynamic with rita i mean i i really was proud of him on one level that he took it upon himself to try to be her caretaker. I mean, although they were, he wasn't really a caretaker. They were having sex. They're in a kind of a relationship, but a, but a very uneven relationship in terms of the distribution of common sense. And, I, and, and not to be mean about it, but just he, he was less traumatized or he was traumatized differently mm-hmm. than she was. Um, so she was more of a dependent and that's tough. You know, it's almost like she was in a, in a childlike state Mm -hmm. and if it's a kid sure of course i'll take care of you but when it's another adult an adult who's older than you in fact that was a lot that he took on he didn't handle it great but he was doing his best and and yeah he felt a little bit of relief and i think a lot of the readers kind of could understand that that's true i think king does a great job of um introducing us to all different types of people like not just the good or bad people survive the plague it's just sometimes it's like the random Upper East Side woman who's addicted to pills and what that would be like. Right. You know, but I agree with you. I think Larry shows the patience of a saint in that <laughs> section. <laughs> he, he did. Remember that show Life After People? Like it was like a TV series and they would like explore like what would happen to our bridges and our skies. Oh, right. Yes. If people just vanished. And they, in one of the early episodes, they talked about like, well, what would happen to pets? Right. Like if. Like if you, if you had a dog or a cat or a bird, like if that animal was trapped inside, they would starve to death. But if, what if they got out in the world and there was like, they, like, they were like, you know, certain animals, which we've bred to be, um, you know, tinier or more fragile for like aesthetic purposes wouldn't survive, but other animals would. And I think of her as Rita as like a, like a really like she she poodle like <laughs> who sleeps on like a purple sequined pillow and oh. has, like has food, eats like people food or something like <laughs> she's, so, she's not bred for survival <laughs> so privileged she's lived in this cloud uh in this uh in this privileged rich life where you can tell that she's never opened a can of food herself let alone like cooked anything for herself just ill-equipped for survival and uh, and of course, then she doesn't. But like to me, she was just the example of like the person who, even though she's immune to the disease, like she's not immune from the sort of hard scrabble existence that faces everyone now. And that was, I think, a brilliant piece of storytelling because she comes in and then she goes pretty quickly. But it's kind of like just because you survive Captain Trips doesn't mean that you're going to survive the, the cruel, cruel world out there. You know, it doesn't mean you're a survivor. <laughs> which yeah. Is yeah. Wow. That's very <laughs> profound. It's very true. Do you guys think you would survive? Each of you, do you think you would be a survivor? Gosh, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a what a great question. question. Do you mean immune or capable of surviving? Let's assume we're all alone. immune. Let's we're assume immune. that we okay. were point of the 1% <laughs> immunity. Okay. And ev- everyone you love is dead. So my we're like in alternate universe, but like we don't have each other. We're not partnered up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that That's a really good question. I, I think part of the reason I love horror and write horror is to try to answer that question for myself, because I, I guess in my head, I am kind of a Rita, you know? Mm-hmm. I grew up with a fairly comfortable childhood and had both of my parents in my life. And, and there were a lot of struggles that I never encountered that that, that are true of so many people I know. So. I like to think I would be a survivor, but to what degree am I deluded? That's something I would find out very quickly. I will say two things are very important. The willingness to defend yourself is super, super important. To pick up a weapon like that, you know, that thing that drives us crazy in horror movies when they're like, ah, but they're not great. Like grab something and hit the dude, you know, and I could, I'm that, I hope I'm that person at least, but I don't know about the rest. I don't know. That's a really good question, Kate. Like, I think, I think if everyone I knew was gone and I, I would, I, I'm not sure I would want to keep going, you know? I think I'd be one of those characters from the chapter of like the others who go mm-hmm. who just, I don't know. I'm not saying I would off myself, but I, I don't know that I would have the will to keep going if I lost everything that I, everyone that I knew. And yeah. I think if I felt like I had 
someone else that I was on the journey with that I could help or protect or who would be company for me and, and had some reason to keep going, I would. But I think, I, yeah, I have to say, I don't know. I don't know that I would be a survivor because I don't know that I'd have the will for it. It would be maybe too overwhelming yeah. if we're being honest. <laughs> That's a beautiful answer. Wow, I feel so selfish now. <laughs> I, think, I think you would totally survive. You you learned toughness from your mom and dad, and, uh, and I think you. I, I would want to, if I had to survive. I would be. A, I would want to be uh, with Tanana Reeve and her group, her crew. We would be great. All of us as a group, we are. We would rule. Well, yeah. <laughs> you got real Nadine issues, though. Like I'm a true Nadine. I got problems, so you don't want to be in my group. I'm easily seduced by power, so oh. it's like we all issues. Mike, would you make it? No way. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, 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 I'll, I'd love to say yes, but I, I just I've seen me when like Postmates shuts down for a night. <laughs> I've watched myself try to make a like a, a really good meal. Um, and I, I feel like I'd want to say like, yes, I, this is where I'd find out that I'm Larry. But this is where I find out I'm the guy who Larry passes, who's like heading to Yankee Stadium for like the worst <laughs> possible reason. And, and like, um, you know, I'm, I'm just afraid that that's, that's, that's the reality of me. And, and that's, and that's how they'll find me. And, or I'll be, I'll be locked in the, uh, I'll be locked in the freezer, you know, that I've been in and out of for two years and never realized <laughs> there wasn't a, it's a, not a latch inside. on this thing. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's, it's like, I, I, I'd love to, to feel like I'm, I'm Stu Redman, but I feel like I'm, I'm a punchline at the end of the paragraph in this story. So yeah. I, 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 I don't think when I, when I was in high school, I gave the stand to uh, my girlfriend and she read it and she was like, you know, who you remind me of, uh, the guy who's with Franny at the beginning. Oh no! <laughs> yes, he's the worst. The, wait, the one no, she, the one she doesn't really care about. Like, <laughs> yeah. It didn't last. Thanks. What can I say? Oh man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like wow. I no told it. That is a diss. <laughs> I know, right? It's stone cold. I think, what about you, Jason? Are you gonna Are you gonna gonna live? Are you going to Vegas? <laughs> I'm always going to Vegas. Um, I I think that I I don't think that any of you are giving yourselves enough credit. I think that one of the great things about writing, and I tell you, if any of us are going to survive, it's Kate, because it's also about um, writing is in a form acting but it's not really quite the same thing. And I think that an actor, especially an actor as great as Kate, I, I think that w you do have a lot of different personalities living in your head. And I think that something would happen where we would suddenly sort of picture the form that we need to step into in order to survive this. Like, it's not a time to be me. It's a time to be this part of me that's compartmentalized that I'm now going to blow up to 100% or I'm going to emulate the, I'm going to pretend to be Clint Eastwood in my head or I'm going to pretend to be, acting is pretending and writing is pretending. And I think that if we could, I think that if we can pretend hard enough that we can survive just about anything. That's a terrible answer probably. But no, I, I thought anything. that was beautiful. That was incredible. That's a beautiful answer. <laughs> Do you charge by the hour? I feel like this is therapy now. That is great. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. It's it's true. I mean, sometimes you just gotta fake it till you make it, and that's all <laughs> acting is really. So I I think that we would survive. And you know, I think speaking of Larry and Rita and survival in general, the we kind of glossed over it earlier, but I want to make sure that we don't because everyone was sort of saying, you know. Of course, there's the tunnel scene. Like, ah. like of course, there's the tunnel. But it's like, it's a big scene. Like, it's an incredible great, scene. It's a great scene. And I think for me, this is only my second time reading. I know a lot of people, I, we've gotten tons of comments from listeners, by the way, who say that they read this book once a year or they read it once every other year or something. And I think that it's the it's this number one scene that I remember the most reading the, the first time around. And I wondered why that was when I revisited it this time and I thought, well, in a, in a very strange way, and maybe you guys can help me figure this out. I, I felt like it's almost a microcosm 
of what's going on in the story with everyone and what the story is about. And, you know, I kept coming back to Stephen King's It, where in It, it's bridges. There's bridges everywhere. There's the trip trapping of the, the Billy Goat's Gruff nursery rhyme. Who's that trip trapping on my bridge? There's the bridge that Adrian Mellon gets thrown off of. There's the bridge that connects the children's library to the adults library in Derry. And it is really about the bridge that we walk from childhood to adulthood and the monsters that we have to face along the way. So now here we are in the stand with this tunnel and I'm just thinking, they even, it's amazing, it's a, it, it's a journey, and the stand is a journey, and they even, they keep talking about journey, they, they use that word, they, there's so much talk about Tolkien before they even enter the tunnel, before they put their first foot in, they're saying it's, they're calling it a, a journey, and what is it they say, they call it, um, it says something about, uh, yeah, Rita says it. She's going on an adventure for the first time since she was a child. Yeah, she says the beginning of a journey, the way leads ever on. And it's sort yeah, of yeah. like it's sort of like, you know, the the tunnel is he's he's now inside, now that he's in the darkness, he's in the literal representation of everything that everyone else is in, which is the unknown. Like I think the, the total darkness and just sort of wondering how are we going, how am I gonna get out of this? How am I going to get to the other end of it? Am I going to even survive it? And on top of it, what do we do as humanity in that moment, in those spaces? What does he do? He just randomly starts to open fire because yeah. his, his imagination has gotten the worst of him. And I just, there's something there that makes me think the tunnel scene is the stand. The tunnel scene, and I, I haven't quite wrapped my head completely around it, but there's, there's something there about having to go into the darkness in order to get to the light on the other end of the tunnel. That, that's what I was going to bring up, with, and it hadn't occurred to me until you said it, uh, was that that language is all over all of the science, all of the poli uh, the political conversation about the pandemic that we're in. I mean, how often a week do we hear someone saying, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel uh, or in any political movement, you know, when they say, oh, th there is a light at the end of this tunnel or not yet, but there will be, you know, the, the immersive darkness with some kind of redemptive light at the end of it um, has become this, this vernacular. It's become part of the language of how we talk about going through a hardship. Um, especially one that's, that takes time. Um, so I, I think that's amazing what you said, that that, that is the stand, that that is the journey of it. Because it's, if you look at it that way, that's the journey that, you know, kind of any harrowing experience that brings about great change uh, has to go through. I think maybe that's why we adopt that vocabulary so easily, kind of so instinctively. But I think it is, um, you're, I think you're, definitely correct that the stand exists in a small microcosm in the tunnel, but I think it's not the tunnel, but you keep saying it when you talk about it, it's light and dark. Yeah. So if it is bridges, the stand is lightness and darkness. Um, there's later on, it's about people turning the lights on in one city and Vegas has the light and then they don't. And flag is the darkness, the black and mother Abigail is the white. And Larry has his tiny light, uh, his lighter in the tunnel and he loses his light and he tries to bring light to the darkness. And like Mike was saying, it is this metaphorical um, language that we all use to talk about trauma, darkness and light. And that's what we really all have in that tunnel is those moments in our lives where we are in pitch black, whatever that means to us emotionally. And we, we can't see the light. And that's, I think that's like the, right, the root of fear for everyone. It's, it's a different tunnel for everybody, but we all have one. Yeah, there are times that, and that's great, uh, that time, just, life just turns mean on you, you know, and, and it feels sort of like this betrayal of everything you knew or expected. I mean, you'd read stories about, of course, older people die, but when it happens to you, there's this, this personal journey and no one is in there with you you know, um, except maybe whatever your faith is. And, and for a lot of people that gets real shaky when they're in the middle of that tunnel too. And I, I agree, that's actually a great observation, Jason, that that is the stand, you know, um, who are you? Who are you when you drop that lighter? Are you that person who can keep 
moving forward and maybe your, your hand is going to be on some dead body or some soldier is going to blow your head off or, or who knows what and, and you die anonymous and alone and you would have been better off you know on the other on, uh, at the beginning of the tunnel so so yeah and that's also one of the scenes that stands out the most to me from the, the miniseries because I know they didn't have a huge budget or I'm assuming they didn't I don't really know for, for a fact but I assumed they didn't have a huge huge budget and I thought that scene was done really well because just visually it's so easy to understand how this would be a horrifying experience to have absolutely anthony what, what what's your how did you feel reading the the lincoln tunnel scene the first time that you read it and was there anything new that you were able to pull from it from this I time mean, i think it still just holds up as one of his best sequences ever i mean it just i think you're saying something for a guy with a career as rich yeah. and varied as his, but um, I thought, uh, you know, it still, uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember what I experienced when I read it for the first time, which was so long ago, but I, 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 I hadn't read a lot about Stephen King, right? Like I had, um, I hadn't read much of like criticism or books about him. I was just reading the books themselves. So I hadn't heard like, oh, you know, there was no, I didn't know other Stephen King fans. There was nobody to say, um, oh, like, wait till you get to the, uh, to the, this tunnel sequence. So I think I just kind of blazed into it and right through it. But I do remember like being really freaked by like that sticks with you for a reason. And uh, it's just, it's, it's being in the dark. It's being in the basement when the light is off. It's being anywhere where there actually is nothing in the tunnel that can hurt them, right? They're dead bodies, but they're, they're entombed in their cars. It's, it's just, you can yeah. see it. And the idea of, of, of them maybe not being dead is the freaky part and the unknown. It's a plunge into the subconscious. And that's what I felt reading it now. I think before it was more like an adventure, like get through go, 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 <laughs> like faster, 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 get out of here. Uh, you know, like you sprint up the basement steps to get out of there when you get those weird chills. Um, but this time I thought, oh yeah, there really is like a psychological layer to this. This is about, as you say, going through, getting through the light and the dark, uh, going through trauma to get toward the other side. Um, it's, it's daunting, really great piece of writing though. And maybe it also ties into sort of this this fear of loss of eyesight, you know, because in like when I don't remember if Nick has lost his uh, eye yet in these pages, but I think he gets attacked later. Right, yeah. right, yeah. But there is something about. He, but he can't, he already can't hear. He can't speak. He's already at super super risk for survivability. If he'd lost both eyes, forget about it, you know. And, and just how how basic and necessary um that eyesight is and how frightening it would be to lose it i had an eye doctor when i was a kid i'm a little nearsighted as you can see and an eye doctor told my mom well you know if you don't make her wear hard contact lenses she's going to be blind by the time she's an adult and it and that was not true but and hard contact lenses are the worst <laughs> when you're eight years old believe me yeah. but because of that experience i have had sort of this lifelong fear of loss of eyesight so i, I know that that had a, a strong impact on on me personally, I often walk around with my eyes closed almost as in practice to not be afraid of the dark, to not be afraid of losing my sight. We can't, go, go ahead, Mike. Oh, um, just, yeah, last, yeah, sorry. Last thing on the, on the, that, on the tunnel that just kind of occurred to me. Um, it's, it's also an incredibly cinematic sequence. Oh, yeah. uh, when you're talking about eyesight, it just made me think about, yes, the, the 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 actual behavior of the light in that you know we we understand so clearly how the lighter works and when it talks about how it gets hot and it has to stop and turn it off and you're in and out of light there's something else that's kind of wonderful about it too in that there's a lot of visual storytelling happening that's all after the fact you know he's he's seeing the evidence of people being gunned down he he surmises that there must have been a barricade and an automatic weapon you know, kind of a turret turned in on the tunnel. And then when he does make it out to the other side, there's that very visual observation of how um, the traffic is backed up on the other side of the tunnel as well. Um, and what that means to him when he says, uh, when he says to Rita, no, because she, she says maybe it was only, only in New York. 
And he says, no, the, the, just seeing, you know, the, the remains of all the other cars there tells him that that isn't the case. And, and there's something kind of magnificently cinematic about that in that, you know, huge battle, this is a battle scene you're talking about that took place in the tunnel um, that's only implied, you know, it's all ghosts now, even to us as readers, we're, we're not privy to that in the present. We're just wandering through the aftermath of it very much like these characters. And I think that's very impactful in a, in a book where he's already um, using a lot of really cinematic technique. There's a, earlier on, I'd, I'd flagged a, an edit that he did between two chapters where he cut out on, uh, on Larry making a strawberry pie and then came into the next chapter on Franny seeing a strawberry pie in the fridge. And you can almost see the edit. Um, it just goes right off the close-ups to hand it off. You know, there, there's, a, there's truly a very visual, you know, pulse running through all this. There, there's, it's written like a movie in a lot of ways. And um, I think the sequence, you know, so far anyway, is for me the most, the most cinematic, the most visual one that we've had. I think that, that's one of the reasons it burrowed in for me. The great, great thing that you brought up about the the strawberry pie. I hadn't, I, I had noticed that, but I hadn't thought about it in terms of cinema. And now that you mention it, you know, I was talking with uh, Steve, we'll call him Steve. Uh, I was talking with Steve's um, first editor who edited The Stand at, at Doubleday. He edited all of his books, um, Bill Thompson. And Bill Thompson said, you know, the thing about um, Stephen King is that he writes with a camera in his head and it's he said I've told him that for years like he that's really something about him like he just writes that way and because of that he's you know been able to make a a lot of uh novels that were perfectly adapted to well if anyone knows it's Mike I mean it's there 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 there's really a great substance there that is cinematic and I hadn't even thought about that how obviously if you were going to be making that into a movie that you would see the strawberry pie go from one to the other well we'll see if Josh does it we'll see if he's, if he's <laughs> keen to, to your uh, your thought process there I love it we've got um one more new character that we were introduced to in these 200 pages that we haven't mentioned yet we have to mention him Kate the trash can man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were too you were too excited. I could see the expression on your face. So you you go you you go first. Trash can. No, this is not going to go the way you think it is because I don't get trash can man at all. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Okay. Got it. Like I know that everyone's like trash is the best, and that's the whole thing about the uncut version is you get all this backstory and a lot more trash can man. Even this time, <laughs> I was like, eh, duh, bleh, why, what? Colin well, Robinson. Is, uh, you know what? I don't. I can't say that much about it either because there is only a small. There's only one chapter really, where we where we see a lot of him, and I have heard too that there's way more of his story in the uncut version. This is my first time reading the uncut version. The only time I've read it was the uh, was the 1970s version that was right. so. I, I, this will be interesting for me. I, okay. I, 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 it was an interesting chapter. I, I enjoyed I'm it. I'm excited to hear your take on that because he is a, a beloved character. Really? To the point that like a lot of people point to him as one of his favorites. His casting was kept a secret for the new version. Really? And I think it's leaked a bit, but it's supposed to be a secret. Everyone loves Trash Can Man. I've never, I've never clicked in. Anyone else love, love Trash Can? Can someone help me out here? Mike! <laughs> of course. I love him, yeah. Well, it was a good marriage while it lasted. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that. Um, yeah, I, I love him. I love him because he's one of the few characters that's utterly unaware of and unconcerned with the events of what's actually happening in the world. Yeah. And I think I can draw a connection between that character and so many people, even unfortunately in this, in this kind of world mess that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a purity to him as a character um, where this is just an agent of kind of human impulse at its most destructive. And it's presented as childish. It, it, he, lacks a, uh, he lacks a cunning evil intent that you get out of Randall Flagg. You know, th this is a, a, a damaged person 
who causes damage and just lives to perpetuate it and it never like an seen Tom. Yeah. It's an interesting echo to Tom. Yeah. And, and, and he never seems to be completely cognizant of what he's doing or why. And, and um, there were just moments in this backstory. I mean, there, there are little, little things that I really appreciated, uh, which I, I noticed a lot on this reader, these tiny echoes to other King books. Um, but there, in his flashbacks, you know, the, the other kids with Trash Can Man, they say, eek, a freak, whenever he's around, which is the same words that Abra Stone in Dr. Sleep says she experiences in people's heads. Um, I expect if you were to dig, that's probably not the only time he, he uses that. Oh. It would be my guess. But wow. specifically, the child hearing wow. eek, a freak, uh, I've seen now in two novels. And, and I only caught it because I've, I've, you know, had to deep dive Dr. Sleep so much, but. Yeah, that's a good um, one, Mike. I haven't heard that. I wonder if that's it, something he was called when he was a kid, you know? I wonder, that's a great point. Uh, that would make sense. Um, I, I think that is probably likely. And, and the, the, that's an interest. If, if that's true, then I would say looking at this character as like, if Glenn Bateman is King's intellect, voice and heart kind of embodied, then Trash Can Man would be his trauma and his violence, that same side of him that creates Richard Bachman, you yeah. know, um, mm. that who just wants to burn it down uh, <laughs> and see what sound it makes. Um, the graveyard shift writer as opposed to the Shawshank Redemption writer. Right? Yeah. Let's write about yeah. people and like, he goes there and I think that, you know, the chapter we began with where the world falls apart and people are shooting each other and, the, the the pink loincloth guy and all that, like these are all of his impulses of like, let's set the world on fire as yeah. a writer. Let's and talk about the, the ultimate outsider. I'm sorry, I hope I didn't cut you off. Talk, talk about the ultimate outsider too. You know, met, he meets his moment at last sort of thing. Maybe that's the appeal. I don't share the fascination yeah. with Trash Can Man that the fans clearly do, but I think that is it. It's just that that ultimate outsider and in, in his moment of power. He's wild and he's untamed and society couldn't control him. He was, a, he was an agent of chaos, even when there were uh, people to sort of keep order in a way, people you know, to care for him or to constrain him. And to me, he's kind of, uh, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't say like he's one of my favorite characters. I find him to be really interesting. He's like a big purple poisonous rose on this birthday cake, <laughs> like he's, He's um he's like Renfield from Dracula, and mm. and kind of like oh you know, yeah like, like crossed with Gollum. That's from, brilliant, Anthony. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's really he's the, totally Renfield. You know, spoiler: We're getting a little bit ahead, but like you think about that Gollum. Gollum's way more enmeshed in the overall story, but it's ultimately Gollum that leads to the destruction of the ring, and it's Trash Can Man who brings yeah. destruction to uh to Vegas. But I think. I think it's also like he is, he's a bit of a free agent, right? Like he's, um, which of these societies that rise up uh, have the, are terraformed for the atmosphere that would attract a trash can man. And he doesn't go toward the society that's trying to build a new world and care for each other and get the electricity back on and, and, and create a, a better society like the one Glenn describes, like if you give five people, get five people together, you, you'll you recreate uh, discrimination and prejudice. Like they're trying to fix the things that went wrong with the mm -hmm. previous society. Trash can manning, he's not going to Denver, you know, like he's, yeah. like he's going to Vegas because that's the, that's the atmosphere that attracts um, violence and, and fire and brimstone. And that's what, that's where he lives. In He's a Sagittarius world. like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're drawn to the flame. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I feel like I, this is so fun to do this once a month. I feel like I could talk to you for all for just hours and hours and hours. Um, but I don't, I don't want to keep you. I, I want to thank everyone uh, for, for being on the show today. Uh, Mike, Tanana Reeve, Anthony, Kate, my new best friend, Kate. Best friends. <laughs> Call me every five minutes. Um, 
Thank and you. I love the haunting of Hill House. I have to say that. So, oh, thank you. Know, you. Man girling here. <laughs> I hope we didn't pull back the curtain too much. No. <laughs> <laughs> Next month, by the way, we'll be discussing chapters 43 through 49, which doesn't sound like much, but it actually is a little more than 200 pages. Um, so uh, go ahead and start your reading of that. You all can get notified. Every listener can get notified of when new episodes go live by subscribing at the standpodcast.com. Again, that's the standpodcast.com. You'll also find links to bonus podcast episodes where I drone on and on for hours by myself. Donata Reeve Dew's online course, you'll find links to that. Um, Anthony's first look at CBS is the stand for Vanity Fair. You'll find all kinds of things over at the standpodcast.com. And as we close today's episode, the Sand Podcast asks you to take a stand. There are so many emergency medical technicians and firefighters who are or were first responders of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we want to support those who have battled medical issues because of this. Uh, who have debilitating injuries or personal tragedies as a result of being on the front lines. The EMS FDNY Help Fund ensures the welfare of the heroes who did put their lives on the line in the epicenter of this pandemic in New York City. So go to thestandpodcast.com, scroll down, and make a donation today. And until next time, remember the place where you make your stand doesn't matter, only that you do and that you're still on your feet. <laughs>